Okay. <laughs> if you missed my little intro, we're going to be doing all kinds of polymer clay stuff. So I have my table set up here, and I have all kinds of clays and tools and great things that I'm going to talk about. So first things first, let's actually talk about clay. Okay, polymer clay comes in lots of brands, and we get a lot of questions regarding what brand should I use, and how do I bake it, and can I combine them? All these different questions, um, the answer is actually usually yes. So what brand should I use? Whatever brand you want. Can I combine them? Yes, you can. Can I bake them together? Of course. What temperature should I bake them at? Well, I'll get into that in a little bit. So first, let's go over this brand issue. Okay, so here I have a whole bunch of brands on the table. Primo is probably the most um, accessible brand. <laughs> Great, Beth, ask them. Primo is a brand that you can buy at most craft stores. So it's um, this is Primo Accents, which is the newest line of colors that they released last year. But Primo is Primo. Okay, so whether it's an Accents or a regular color, this one is Accents because it has pearl in it. So that is their fancy way of saying this is not just a plain color of clay. So all of their clays that are translucent, which means light can pass through them, or glow in the dark, or have a pearl, or a glitter in them, they're all called accents. And all the regular colors, which they call artist colors, which come in colors like um, aquamarine blue, raw sienna, those kinds of, um, oh, awesome, Primo's on sale at Michael's, so go get some. Um, all the artist colors are basically opaque colors. They all mix together into what you would expect. Like if you mix red and yellow, you're going to get orange. Um, and they're just called Primo. And the special ones are called Accents. So it doesn't matter which kind you use, they all go together. I will tell you why Primo is the one that Elisa and I use the most when I'm done telling you about the rest of this stuff. Okay, so this is a two ounce block of Primo. This is a pounder. So this is a 16 ounce brick and it's got a little bit of it cut off. Um, so I've used some of this white. This is the new Primo white. Okay, and you can if you can find this at your local store or online, this is usually a better value because the pounder is like 12 bucks as opposed to these which average 279. Okay, then we have Fimo, which may be the brand that everyone is most familiar with. And Fimo is by Eberhard Favor, and this is a Fimo effect color. So Fimo, when they are doing a glitter or transparent or um, mica type of color, they call it effect. And that's the effect to the Primo accent. So everybody's got their little trademark name for their special type of clay. Um, and then there is Fimo um, Classic, which is incredibly difficult to condition and get ready. Um, it is hard. It's one of the first polymer clays that came out on the market. And it's the one that we like the least only because it takes so long to condition it. Um, not because Fimo isn't a good clay, Fimo's a great clay. All right, then there's also Fimo Soft, which is the same formulation but with more softeners in it. And depending upon what kind of working hands you have, okay, mine tend to be cold, Elisa's tend to be hot. If you have hot hands, your clay gets mushy if it's soft to start with. If you have hot hands and you're trying to use Fimo Classic, it might be advantageous because it will help you to soften it quicker. So depending on how strong your hands are and how hot or cold they are will also determine 
um, what kind of clay you you personally like to work with. Okay, so Fimo is another professional good brand of clay. So Fimo and Primo, you can make things that you're going to sell, jewelry items, stuff like that. Okay, Cernit is another brand that we really like. Um, I like it more than Elisa does, and by now you might be able to guess why. Because Cernit is soft, and in Elisa's hands it turns to goo really quickly, but in my hands it turns to putty. So there's a consistency issue, and I'm going to show you what that means in a, in a couple minutes, okay? So Cernit is also a popular brand for people who are making things to sell. We're going to talk about why you would use one clay over the other when you're selling something in a minute. Okay, so a lot of people use Cernit for doll making as well because all of the Cernit colors, whether they are glamour colors or not, and glamour is Cernit's way of saying it has something sparkly in it or it's translucent. So, and number one, which is what this is, is just their regular colored clays. But all of them have some degree, some small degree, of translucency, which means they allow the light to pass through them. And when you're looking at a Cernit flush color, which they have all the multicolor, uh, multicultural colors of flesh, from pale porcelain to deep ebony, and all the different ranges in between. So you can make um, like any variation of skin color from the Cernit doll colors and that's why they're so popular with doll artists because they allow a little light to pass through which you know you can tell you can see on on our human skin when the light passes through it's how you can tell that we're kinda real so the Cernit doll colors are really nice but they're also fabulous they have a full range of colors for jewelry making and home decor as well and those three clays the Primo, the Fimo, and the Cernit are nice and strong yet flexible when they're baked which is why you can make things to sell from them because you won't be afraid that they're going to snap on you or um, eventually turn brittle okay so I have some other things here Pardo this is Pardo jewelry clay and it comes in this jar which is in theory it's a good idea but it kinda can make it um, a little more difficult to store and this is 2.7 ounces and the Pardo comes in these little balls okay so um, right out of the package Pardo is incredibly soft it's again one of those clays that turns to mush in Elisa's hands but I really like it because it's easy to condition for me um, <clears throat> oh, sorry it's lagging guys so the Pardo is a little harder to find, okay, but it is a great little clay. It's a little more pricey. This 2.7 ouncer is around $5. It's by a company called Viva Decor. And Viva Decor, you will hear me expound upon their paints because they have awesome, incredible paints that work really well with mixed media and clay. But um they're clay because it's harder for us to find and more expensive. We don't, we don't tend to play with it a lot. But they did give me a whole bunch of colors um, at a Cha show, so I do have it to play with. Um, Pardo has beeswax in it, which is one of the things that makes it so soft. And it is extremely flexible when baked, which is another good reason to use it for things you're going to sell. Okay, however, I have had things snap, <coughs> excuse me, I've had things snap on me made out of Pardo so I get nervous about selling things that I made out of it. Um, okay, let's get into the other more obscure types. Okay, this is Sculpey 3. Sculpey 3 and the color that I'm looking at here is the translucent. There's a reason why I pulled out these two colors and I'm going to explain it in a minute, but Sculpey 3, this is a child's clay. This clay bakes up relatively hard, but it's also extremely brittle after baking. So Sculpey 3 
is great. They've got lots and lots of colors in their line. However, I would not ever make anything to sell out of only Sculpey 3 because you are risking that your piece is going to break in the long run. And I would never risk using a material that I know is prone to breakage for something that I'm going to sell. So Sculpey 3 is great for practicing. It has all the properties of, um, of polymer clay. But when you're ready to start selling, I would move up into the Primo brand. Okay, Sculpey 3 straight out of the package is a fairly soft clay. And it conditions up really quickly just in your hands. All right, Fimo effect and they call this color transparent white plus Sculpey 3 translucent. This combination, half and half, if you mix them together, is probably the most transparent translucent that we can come up with. Okay, and we've experimented a lot. I use a lot of translucent clay. Elisa, not so much. But um, through our travels, we have discovered that this, this combination of clay together, half and half, is a very transparent, translucent clay. So that, um, use the Sculpey for a prototype and do the real stuff with Primo, is is totally a great idea, Beth. That's usually what I do. Um, okay, so if you're doing caning and you need a transparent edge to something, uh, or you want to be able to see through to another layer of what's underneath, mix these two together, and now you've got a clay that has the strength of Fimo with the transparency and the softness of Sculpey. So when you bake them together, you're going to get a, a better product than using one or the other alone. Okay, and then here's a couple other things that are around. A couple years ago, Sculpey, or the Polyform Company, which is the parent company to Sculpey and Primo, they came out with this awesome clay called Studio by Sculpey. So when Studio by Sculpey came out, they sent us all the colors, and we got to play with them, and I fell in love. I really love this clay. Um, however, their marketing scheme for this clay kind of fell apart and they discontinued it like two years after releasing it. So then I snapped up as much as I could find. Um, <laughs> so the reason I, I liked this clay is because it is incredibly strong after baking and it has muscle memory, which means if you were to make a... Actually, I have something that I can show you. Uh, if you were to make something like a bangle bracelet, which is what this is right here, made out of Studio by Sculpey, you can mush it and change it and twist it and bend it, and it it's like that rubber man. It kind of like goes back to its original and, and, and just pretends that you never smushed it, which is why it's great for something like a bracelet that you need to get over your wrist because you can smush it a little bit. Okay, so the Studio by Sculpey has its good purposes, and I tend to snap it up whenever I can find it, but you really are getting less and less able to find this clay. So we'll just set that aside. I'm not going to really play with it. Uh, if you're a person who makes large forms and you need to make armatures and you need scrap clay, you can usually buy like boxes of scrap clay on eBay or whatever, but you can also actually purchase a log of it. This is just a log of mixed color scrap clay. And you can get this from Stanislaus Imports. And this is the same guy who um, we got the squeegees from if you watch us do some silk screening. So he's got all kinds of tools and stuff. And one of the things that you can get is this log of, of scrap clay for putting on the insides of things. And I think this, this log was a couple bucks. 
because it's really just whatever they extrude out of the machine after they're making the real colors. This is like the cleanup clay. <laughs> Elisa also does have a thousand pounds of scrap clay, so you can probably get some from her if you need it. Uh, all right, and then next on the on the table here. We're just going to talk about this stuff. This was my first clay. This is how I discovered that I loved polymer clay. Was when I got a box of this from my mom around Christmas time. And this is Sculpey. Plain old regular Sculpey clay. It comes in a brick. I think it's a two pound brick. Rose, there's Sculpey Bacon Bend, but you can only buy Sculpey Bacon Bend in a like six or eight color package. You can't buy it in individual colors anymore. Alright, so this is your brick, your standard brick of Sculpey regular clay. It comes in white. And then there's something else called Sculpey Firm. And Sculpey Firm comes in... Um, I think it's like a fleshy color. All right, so regular old Sculpey here is so easy to condition that you can just grab it straight out of the package and start mushing it. And my hands, like I said, are super cold um, and not very strong because I tend to be very, very delicate when I touch things. I'm not, a, I'm not a strong gripper. So, I mean, you can see right now that this clay has turned to mush in my hands and I've only been working with it for like 20 seconds. Okay? This clay is awesome for prototyping, not great for selling. Don't ever sell anything you make out of this clay unless... I'm going to show you something that I used it for um, in a few minutes. but. This is the clay I'm going to use to play with today because it's so easy to condition that I won't have to do a lot of um, conditioning in, in order to play around and show you how to use it. So, next I am going to show you what I mean by conditioning. Okay, and the, the tool that most people use for that is going to be this little baby right here, which is a pasta machine. Mine is an Atlas brand, which is probably, a lot of people say, the best brand you can get. Um, my machine, because it's Atlas, is calibrated so that the number one is the widest setting, and then it goes down from there. So. It goes all the way up to a 7. Some go up to a 9. Um, yes, they do have them all the time at yard sales. You're right about that. Because people buy a pasta machine thinking they're going to make pasta, and then they don't. So they sell them. This machine new um, is like $150. So definitely go look at a sale for them. They also make a mounted um, motor for it so that you don't have to hand crank it. That's what this little baby is right here, is the crank. Um, on my Atlas machine, a 5 is the smallest I go with my clay. Otherwise, it ripples so much that it's so thin that I can't, um, can't really do anything with the clay. Uh... <laughs> Okay, so yeah, my, my mother-in-law, um, she was so happy the day that I asked her if she had a pasta machine that I could borrow because I think that she believed I was going to make pasta for her son and she was sadly, sadly mistaken about that. I mean, not that I don't make pasta for my husband because <laughs> I totally actually do like making handmade pasta, but I make it by hand. I don't. I would never dream of, of using my pasta machine to actually make pasta. <laughs> All right, so <clears throat> your pasta machine, if you 
don't have hot hands, okay, is going to become your favorite tool. Now there are lots of ways that you can get this thing to work and one of the things people ask all the time is how do you get the handle to stay in? Well, because it's got this little thing on the side here and you just have to kind of like drop it in and figure out where the notch goes and then you can turn it. Um, there's no real magic solution to this. Some people will cut off the end of like a rubber latex, <coughs> excuse me, a latex rubber glove or whatever and shove it in the hole and then shove this in there and it kind of gets stuck. Um, I just live with it. I mean, I put it in there and I realize that I have to press down and around so that it doesn't come out on me. So I really wish there was a better answer for that, but in order to make this collapsible and able to um, take apart easily and be like, I don't know, I guess they thought that your pasta machine wasn't something you would want hanging out on your kitchen cabinet or whatever all the time, they made it easy to take, take it apart and put it away. And unfortunately, when you're really in a good crank session, um, you know, you can lose your handle pretty easily. But then the other thing you'll need is some heavy-duty clamps from Home Depot or Lowe's or wherever um, to clamp it to the table. Rubber bands for braces wrapped around the handle hold it in place. Okay, Tristan. Um, I mean, I have used all kinds of things in my machine and nothing really works for me. So experiment. Rubber bands and all that kind of stuff is are all things that you could try to use. Um, this is a nice, real strong, heavy-duty clamp, and my pasta machine actually lives on the corner of my tabletop where I can use it all the time. So if you're going to use it a lot, find a nice, convenient place in your studio to set it up where you can leave it. Okay. Some other tricks about this are that um, they're really the things that make your pasta machine work are the rollers right here. So you've got to keep them relatively clean, but you can also pull this sucker apart. There are screws and it's all like Allen wrenches and stuff. You can pull it apart to clean it and then you can take these outer plates off. They don't even have to be put back on again. There's actually a company, is that, is it Polymer Clay Express, Elisa? Um, where you can send your pasta machine and they will like do a tune-up and when they put it back together, they'll take those plates off for you so that if you're nervous about it, um, they, they'll, they'll do it for you for like a low fee, 20 bucks or something like that. So <clears throat> mine tends to be dirty and gunked up and whatever. I don't, I don't worry too much about the, the quality of my um, pasta machine because honestly, unless you're rolling white and you want everything to be pure crystal, pure white, um, it doesn't really matter because a little chunk of clay this big, like that's what just fell out of the bottom of the machine, is not going to affect the quality of the color in the long run. Okay? No big deal. So now let's talk about the sheets that you get when you roll through. This is the thickness of a number one sheet of clay. And basically, you just fold your clay in half this way and run it through the machine with the fold on the side. Not like this. If you put it in the machine like a taco, then you're going to trap air bubbles inside the clay. But if you put it in the machine this way, like a C, straight down into the rollers, then all the air bubbles get shot up through the top and they don't get stuck inside the clay. Okay, so that's the way we roll. And then people ask, how many times do you roll it through to condition the clay? Because some people say 15, some people say 20, some people say 30, some people say 50. And the answer to that is, when you have a nice, clean sheet of clay that doesn't have crumbly edges, you are done. If it takes 15 times, if it takes 30 times, okay, because um, conditioning means that you're getting the clay to all stick together and be one nice consistency. Because straight out of the package, um, 
it can be lumpy. There can be inconsistent little lumps inside there. It can have air bubbles. And what you're trying to do with the pasta machine is even it all out and mush it all together. Okay, so that's the purpose of conditioning the clay. You don't just grab it out of the package and start making something with it. All right, so I'm going to move this aside because my camera angle here is not going to be good at capturing using the pasta machine, unfortunately. All right, so other tricks and tips here. These four tools, plus my blades, are what are always present on my work surface by my right hand. Okay, so I have this, which is a <clears throat> soft rubber tipped, it's actually for paint, it's a color shaper that I got at the art store in the paintbrush section. And it's good for gently mushing clay where I want it. It's good for poking holes either end for like making dents in the clay. Okay. This is a needle tool by Kemper, where the ceramic tools are. And it's a fairly fine-tipped needle tool. Everybody needs a needle tool. Um, another good needle tool to have around is just a simple bamboo skewer, which right now I can't find my bamboo skewer, but I also usually have one of those lying around. And then I have an X-Acto knife for cutting. Um, I use this to cut my baked clay if I need to trim something, and also for cutting small pieces. I have a long, flexible blade for cutting curves. And this is actually a clay blade. And clay blades are made with this little notch. I don't know if you can see the notch on this end. Oop. Try to get it to where you can see. See how it's got like a notched edge here? Right here is what I'm talking about. That shows you which end of the blade is not the sharp side because you can totally take your finger off with one of these. So, you know, we urge you to be careful when you're learning how to use your blades. You can usually see which side is the sharp side, but some, you know, one day if you grab this thing and you push down on it hard on the side that's sharp rather than the side that's notched, you're going to find out what I mean, so be careful. And then this blade is called a tissue blade. And um, it's, it has humble origins. <laughs> uh, yeah, these little notches on the side go into surgical tools because this is actually a tool that they use for um, dissecting cadavers. And it's a very stiff blade, stiff and thin because you're able to take very thin slices um, off of whatever you're trying to cut with this blade. It tends to be stiffer, you can't bend it as much, and it's good for when you want to have a lot of control over what you're cutting. And then here we have something called an etch and pearl. This is also by uh, Polyform. It's a Primo Sculpey tool. And on one end, it's got what looks like a knitting needle. And on the other end, it has a cup. So what this is for is either for making circular shapes in the clay, or you can fill this little cup with clay, like that. And then when you press it onto another surface, you can press and give it a little twist, and it makes like a little nubbin of clay. So this comes in a set of three, and then with that little nub of clay, you can do other stuff to it. And maybe make a flower center. Hang on, my lighting is weird, and it's got, it takes a second to let you see what it's doing. Okay, so, oh yeah, you can do all kinds of things with this clay. All right, so let's get on to talking about baking real quick, because that's another major concern that people have. Um, baking this clay, every clay will have 
some instructions on it for how what temperature to bake. This um, Pardo clay, for example, it says knead until soft and smooth, shape into desired form, bake in a home or convection oven at 266 Fahrenheit or 130 Celsius for 30 minutes per quarter inch. Okay, so that 30 minutes per quarter inch is a, a um, general theme there. <laughs> A theme for all clays. You want to go 30 minutes per quarter inch of thickness. So if what you are baking is about a quarter inch thick, like this is, it's going to be baked for 30 minutes. It doesn't mean how wide it is, it means how thick the clay is. Oh, yeah, the tissue blades are different from the ones at Michael's or Joanne's, yes. Uh, and I get them online at a place called clayalley.com. Um, I like the tissue blades for cutting canes because they give me a more delicate feel. I mean, all of this is relative. When you start using tools, you will discover what works for you. Okay, so back to the baking. This is a uh, quarter inch thick. It's going to be baked for half an hour. If something's thicker and fatter, you can bake it for longer. Baking something longer does not damage it. In fact, you could put something in the oven tonight, forget about it, and come back tomorrow morning, and it would be fine. The thing that damages the clay is the temperature. Okay, so this one said 266. Now let's say I'm going to mix together some of this pardo with some of this Sculpey clay. All right, and I'm going to get a clay that's stiffer and a different color, obviously. Um, it's going to have the properties of both clays. So at this small amount, um, my my Pardo is not going to influence the Sculpey working properties that much. They're both pretty soft. Um, but you can see how you can color the clay pretty easily by mixing it together like that. Okay, so now I have a conundrum because the baking temperature of this is 275 and the baking temperature of this is 266. So. What do I bake it at? And the answer is going to be for this one in particular, about halfway between them, which would be about 270, and I would go twice as long. Because length of time will get the plasticizers out. Okay, so don't don't say, well, I'm gonna bake it for a higher temperature, because I'll tell you what happened to me one time. I baked my stuff at a higher temperature than was recommended, and I did it by accident. You know, my oven had been set really high because I was playing with some other stuff that I shouldn't have been doing. I was trying to melt plastic in my um, toaster oven, and I had it set to 500. And then I forgot, so I shoved my polymer clay in there and le left it in there for half an hour at 500 degrees. And um, do you know what happens to polymer clay, you know? Like, you know those lovely things that you eat at a campfire, marshmallows, and what happens to them when they catch on fire and they turn black and crusty? So when I went to my oven to pull out my polymer clay piece, it was black and crusty and had blown up to like five times the original size. So that's what happens to polymer clay at too high a temperature. But you, can har you can't possibly bake it for too long of a time. So if you're concerned... Um, I do like to eat them like that, Anne, but not my polymer clay. <laughs> of course, you know, they've discovered that that black stuff on the marshmallows is a carcinogen, so you're not supposed to eat your marshmallows that way. Um, because you'll give yourself cancer. So, anyway... So I here's the thing. Don't say I'm going to I'm going to do my clay at a lower temperature for a longer time because the clay company has a formula. It's a chemical formula of what's in their clay. And whatever it is, 
it has a chemical properties of baking out at a specific set temperature. So you trying to foil the clay company by not baking it at the right temperature is only going to damage you. The clay company doesn't care. Okay, so always bake it at the highest temperature you can for the brand of clay that you're using and for longer if you're concerned that maybe the piece is thicker than a quarter inch or whatever. Um, it doesn't hurt it to bake longer, but you must bake it at the right temperature. Okay? So that's the answer about baking. Now, next, you know, can I bake it in my home oven? Sure. Is it a great idea to eat out of it right afterwards? Mm, probably not, because of the inside of the oven is going to be coated with polymer clay fumes. Um, and the residues and oils and stuff that bake out during the baking process. So a lot of people will take a baking pan covered with foil to seal it all in and uh, and then and then bake it. Okay? So then you can take it outside onto your porch or the yard or whatever, peel off the foil, which is going to be tented, domed, so to speak. You don't want it to touch the clay because it'll make it wrinkle. Um, but dome the foil over like a baking pan with the clay inside. That, that makes a sufficient atmosphere for safely baking the clay in your home oven. Or you can do what I do. I, take a, I bought a toaster oven that is clay dedicated, and that's where my clay is baked. And I always use the foil over the top of it so that it can like bounce the heat around inside the oven because... Um, you know, when you're in a toaster, you only have this much room between what you're baking and the elements of the oven, so you don't want it to be too hot in there and, and scorch the clay. So, all right. Next, I just want to show you another easy way that you can condition, okay? These are available um, from us. We have them in four different colors. Or you can buy a plain boring one at the store. It's just a one inch acrylic rod. And you can use it. As you can see, I have a glass tabletop. And just roll the clay and fold it. Roll and fold. And this will condition clay for you to get it into that nice consistency that we've been talking about. Okay, now, what if you're messing with your clay like I'm about to do to get some texture on it? This is a piece of um, vinyl fabric that I got off a scrapbook. So I'm going to roll some texture over it. I think I'm actually going to drop my camera down so you can get a better view, so bear with me for a second. Alright, so I've rolled the texture onto this clay and now the clay is pretty much stuck to the table. Okay, along comes your blade, which you're going to use to just scoop the clay off the glass or the tile or whatever you had it stuck to. Okay, so that's an easy way. I don't know if you can see the texture that I got on there from doing that. Okay, so if you're ever working on your tile or your table, which tiles are another great thing to keep around, I keep these in my studio. These are six inch white tiles for working on. Okay, and I just keep them around in order to use them when I'm working with clay. So I'm going to leave this because, of course, I'll want to play with that later. And I just want to show you a couple other things that we really like to use for texture because that's one of the easiest ways to kind of play with clay is to get texture onto it. So these are, <clears throat> who are these by? Art Scratch, Scratch Art, okay. 
So they have two sides. We have lots of these. We play with them all the time. They have the raised side and the debossed side. And you can use either side. So you can press the debossed side in and you'll get a raised design on your clay. Or you can press the embossed side in. That was my New Jersey coming out. The embossed side. And, and you've got the, the down in texture. Oops. Okay, so those types of texture plates are pretty cool because they give you a couple. <laughs> I knew Kelly would like that. You know, Kelly, I grew up walking the dog and drinking coffee, but I moved so many times all over the United States that, and I was teased mercilessly when I went to school in Buffalo because my accent was so strong from downstate. It was horrible, and I eventually completely flattened and lost all accent, and now nobody can tell where I'm from, which is fine. So, <laughs> but yeah, I grew up on the border of New York and New Jersey, and so close to New Jersey that my prom and my wedding were both in New Jersey, even though I grew up in New York. So that's where I'm from. But, uh, you know, texturing your clay is a great way to mess around and play and and do fun things with it and this type of texture mat is not the only way to do that I have so many tools here on my table that I just want to quickly show you this is actually a Wilton fondant mat and it's got some beautiful interesting wonderful textures on it okay with all these different this is a like an Indian henna pattern one um, I have rubber stamps, and these are clear stamps in a couple different brands. So I bought these because they are borders and designs, and I'm going to show you uh, here. I have this whole container full of things that I made using that border stamp. And a long time ago, I did a Tuesday Schmooze Day show, which you can now get in my replay section, where I took clay, I took exactly what I'm doing right now, I took the um, white studio or Sculpey clay, and I stuck it on tiles, and I used this stamp to make all different strips. And I just left them right on the tile to bake, pulled them off, and I painted a bunch of them in my signature colors, which are pink, turquoise, and orange. I left a bunch of them natural because I'll use them in the future. I just I went on like a huge mega strip making frenzy one day, and I just made lots and lots of these strips, and they're going to be used up in mosaic type projects in the future. So that's what you can do. Just roll it flat onto a tile and make your stamped things and then when they come out of the oven and they're white like this, you can paint them with regular old acrylic paints or craft paints or inks or whatever. So these are done with like the apple barrel, one, you know, one coat whatever paint that I got at Michael's. And now I have, like, here's a text one. So I have all of these ready-made strips that I can use in my mixed media projects. I have polka dots, all kinds of fun, fun textures that I just got from all of the rubber stamps that I have in my studio. So take out your rubber stamps and, and use them for your clay because they are lovely. I use mostly unmounted, a lot of clear stamps, which the only caveat about clear stamps is that you have to watch for how deeply um, etched they are. A less deeply etched stamp is going to give you less of an impression. So you've got to watch. You know, this one is a very uh, not deeply etched stamp, so it's giving me sort of a ghost impression and not a deep, deep texture. So it all depends on what you're looking for. Okay, 
Then there are stamps that are specifically made for clay, like these. This is Elisa Pavelka. This is her Fleur de Lis pattern, and you can see it is a pretty deep stamp. So when you use it, you're going to get a very deep impression on your clay. And then this one is by a company called Cool Tools. It's also a deep stamp made specifically for polymer and metal clays. And when you use it, you get a nice, deep, crisp impression. OK, so that's, these are like clay stamps. And then you can, of course, use your regular woodblock stamps. When you find something that you like, pick it up. I, I get all kinds of stamps at the store. When I see something I like, I buy it because I know if, as long as it's deeply etched, that I can use it with my polymer. Even though I'm not much of a paper artist, I, I always know I can use it with my polymer clay. All right, so if you're going to do stamping, then you're going to get into molding. And this is a Lisa Pavelka border mold. And basically, the concept here is that you roll out a snake, you press it in. This is like a bamboo and cherry blossom kind of a thing, and pull it out. Um, also, in my replays, you can find where I made a bracelet using this border mold, and I made like a bamboo and pearl bracelet. So I made the, the whole parts of that on camera, so you can watch that happening. But, but basically, look at, look at these types of things as um, things you can experiment with. You know, Just because this is a border mold doesn't mean you can't use it for something else. I actually used it to make beads. So this one is like a deeply etched jungle leaf kind of a thing. Okay, so these come in, I think, four different styles. And then you already saw the Wilton mold. And I have some other molds over here okay, that I've been playing with. This, of course, I do a lot of wings in my jewelry. So I make my own molds out of Amazing Mold Putty, which is really easy to use. I've also done that on a Tuesday Schmooze Day. And then this is something I just got. This is actually a cupcake top. And I made this little guy out of that by just pressing it in and then cutting out the extra. So I went to a specialty baking shop here in town called Make It Sweet. And I found these, and they were so super cool. They're by a company called Gem Cutters. And this is what came out of it. So I'm pretty stoked because it's very mechanical looking, which I kind of like. And then you can do things to it. You know, once it comes out of the mold, I pinched the edges a little. and You know, you can take away some of that mechanical look by messing with it yourself. So I think this one kind of looks like a sunflower. And it could also maybe benefit from some more texturing. So you can mess with it until you're happy. And then these are wings that are I'm doing for a project. And they came out of a mold very similar to this one. So if you like something um, and you want to mold it, you know, get some amazing mold putty. And I think several of the girls on our um, team, like, like Kelly. Kelly, we're so proud of Kelly because her piece is actually on the amazing mold putty packaging. So go Kelly. It's our favorite molding product because it's it's a good value for the money. It's a two part. You mix two parts together and you get this putty that you can put on something and 15 minutes later you have this nice durable mold. Okay, so these wings came from that. This I think I'm going to play with. Somebody said, oh, I would grunge it up. Well, I'll do that. All right. Oh, uh, what else do I have? Oh, let's play. Okay, these are metallic rub-ons. They're waxes. And they are by Earth Tones Kit Number 2 Crafty Products from North Carolina. Now, I hope they're still in business because I really like these little things. 
okay, and they're basically like a wax that you can use to enhance your clay. So here we have, you get a little on your finger, and then you can highlight your design. This is like a green, and the cool thing about these waxes is that they are pretty strong colors, and you can use them before and after baking. So you can totally, um, you know, if you decided that the piece that you were working on didn't have enough color on it before you baked it, you can come back with this type of wax, which is basically like rub and buff, Inca gold, uh, Gilder's Paste, those are all basically waxes with metallic colorants in them and you can use them on the clay before or after. So it's it's nice. Martiel is live at one in four minutes. Ah, We're all overlapping each other today. Okay, so another way you can do this coloring thing is that polymer clay is tacky. So you probably could use some powders. Now, polymer clay is such an extensive, crazy, wonderful medium that you see I have done an hour here and I've only touched the surface. And I really don't want to overlap Martiel's show. So I am going to say this. I'm coming back. And I'm all like relaxed because I was it's hot under these filming lights and it's also decided that now in central Texas it's going to go from absolute winter which it was last week to absolute summer so it's suddenly 85 degrees when last week it was like 50 so ha ah, thanks my leopard is multicolor leopard <laughs> um, okay what are we asking who will you link up under show what do I what ask me again Kelly oh these you want me to put a link to these I will I'll put some links to the different kinds of waxes that you can get under the video and I'm gonna say that next time I do a Tuesday schmooze day I will pick up where I left off with the coloring on the surface before and after baking and we'll just keep going and I'll teach you some more things about polymer clay um, I hope that you got some information today that will help you get started and you know as far as choosing a clay if you're brand new to polymer clay pick whatever's on sale and just start playing with it and get to know how it works with your fingers what kind of style you have as far as working with it do you want a soft clay or a hard clay and then you can go from there and you can use the information I gave you before to decide you know if you're gonna sell it which brand should you make things out of um, <laughs> you're welcome guys and please stay on and you'll see Martiel in a couple of minutes she will be live so thank you so much for joining me today on Crafty Link Tuesday Schmooze Day and I will see you next time <laughs>